this is uh, this is a great conversation, and uh, I, I wish that I had been here yesterday and had an opportunity to spend a little bit more time with all of you because uh, the, the conversation, not just around community schools, but how we're going to change fundamentally educational outcomes to create that kind of democracy that Ira talks about, uh, to create the fairness and the and the justice that that David talks about. Uh, to do the work that we all know as leaders of our communities has to be done, and it has to be done rapidly, uh, I think is the most important conversation that we can have. So I have to give two shout outs. First of all, uh, I'm president of the National League of Cities this, this year, and we have done tremendous work, particularly through the Institute for Youth Education and Families, to really set the table for community leaders, particularly mayors and city council members, to have a role in education and to figure out what it is that they can do. And so I'm used to being in a group full of mayors that actually uh, have that mindset. And I am stunned when I am with a mayor that doesn't have that mindset. Because if you're not having this conversation, then you're not talking about the future well-being of your community, plain and simple. You have to be engaged in the education conversation, and you have to take a lead role. But there's another phrase that mayors use a lot that don't control the school districts, as most of us do not. Uh, they say, well, I don't have a real role in education or I don't control education. Well, it's maybe true if you're only thinking about education as something that happens inside the walls of a school. But the Mott Foundation told us a long time ago that education is something that happens all day, every day, 365 days a year. And when you think of education that, year, that way, there is no more important role than the role of the mayor, because the tools that we have at our disposals to create great, great uh, educational systems and out-of-school time programs in our parks and in our libraries, the things that we can do to educate the people that interact with children, like our police officers, so that they understand how to interact with young kids that are in despair, uh, that don't necessarily look like them or don't have their same background. To do real deep dives on racial equity work with all of your staff, as we've done in, in, our, in our city of St. Paul. You want to have an interesting conversation, have a bunch of cops sitting around talking about racial equity. It makes them really uncomfortable. <laughs> but when they have that breakthrough moment, uh, it is a really powerful thing to see because it changes how they approach their policing. And even in our Parks and Rec Center, we're opening up a new combined uh, library and, and, and uh, rec center in just a couple of weeks. But already the 60 staff workers that are going to be part of that, that community center have not only engaged uh, with each other about how they're going to merge their staffs into kind of a seamless web of support for the children, but they did a two-day uh, standalone seminar or, or, or deep dive on racial equity work so that the minute the doors of that center open, they're dealing and they're addressing with some fundamental issues of disparities in our community. There are so many things that I think have been said that are profound uh, up here. And, and, and I think Ken said, the evidence is on our side. But it reminded me of a quote that I read this morning as I was on my way down here, and it was actually in the context of the correction system in New York and whether or not there was a proposal for uh, providing college degrees for prison inmates. And there, of course, you know, any conversation about a good practice like that immediately gets thrown into politics and people go crazy. But there was a great quote from a person that, that had been working deeply in the correction system, and he said, there's almost a complete disconnect between what we know and what we do. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that that exact same thing can be said about the edu education conversation. We know what to do. We know what has to be done. We know the resources that are required to fix this problem and these challenges that we face across our country, but we're not doing it. And we're not doing it because we don't embrace solutions like community schools to have all of those resources brought together to support our students and to support the families. And when we disconnect the things that we know affect an educational outcome, we're doing a disservice to our children. When we know that vi domestic violence in a household uh, has a direct correlation between the, that student's success, then if we're not connecting those dots when, a, when we go into a home with an officer or, or a social worker and see domestic violence and figure out how to connect that to the conversation around school, then we're, we have a disconnect. When we know that 10 or 20 percent of our, of our students have, a, have a, a, a mental illness or a diagnosable but untreated mental illness, and we're not providing the resources and the support and the funding to deal with those, with those mental illnesses that their children are suffering from, then we have a disconnect and we're not ultimately going to solve the challenges. And so we can point our fingers at teachers all we want. We can sit there and say it's your fault. But I think it's more important that we point our finger at the mirror and say, what is it that we're going to do to change outcomes for our children, and what role do all of us play in that conversation? 
We know that community schools work in the city of St. Paul, and we've seen it. And what's really interesting about it is we've seen not only how communities can change the schools, but how community schools can change the neighborhoods that they're in and create a, create a, a fundamental place where kids want to learn, where people thrive, where families feel like they're supported, where they know where to turn for help, whether it's an issue of a dental uh, uh, you know, situation or mental illness or just a, a place where people are looking for a job, all of those things that, that can be housed under a community school's roof. When we connect those dots, we all of a sudden change outcomes for children. It is absolutely critical that we have strong leadership in our schools and that we have strong teachers. We've seen when that doesn't, uh, that when that doesn't exist, we have two community schools, Dayton's Bluff and John A. Johnson. And for, for periods of time, the outcomes for those children have gone up and they've gone down. Though the path forward is fairly consistent and the, and the increases in the students' achievement are fairly uh, continuing to increase. But there have been times where the building leadership hasn't been as strong as it needed to be to really take advantage of the, of the solutions that were in the school under the community uh, schools model. And so it, it takes both sides of the equation. It takes sc strong schools, strong principals, strong building leaders, and it also takes the work of all of us in this community, in our communities, to make a difference for our children. There's a disconnect between what we know and what we do. Mm -hmm. And if we allow that disconnect to continue, then the results that we see, that we all are just are embarrassed by, in terms of achievement gaps, in terms of lack of preparation for college, lack of preparation for work, will continue in our country. And I don't think that we can afford to waste another generation of our children and to condemn them to poverty and despair and all the challenges that come with not being able to take their place in the 21st century workforce. Community schools, I think was said earlier, is not an answer, it is the answer. And when we work on that, we do right by the future of our communities. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you.